Good afternoon or morning or evening, whatever time of day you're listening to this. I wish you a good day. Today is September 10th. We continue in Ezekiel chapters 34 through 36. Chapters 34 is uh, chapter 34 begins a section uh, that contrasts uh, the false shepherds with the true shepherd. Uh, while chapter 33 may, uh, marks the shift from judgment toward hope, uh, it is not exclusively devoted to hope. Rather, it's mixed with judgment in chapters 34 and 35. Uh, to be more precise, hope for the people as a whole is inherently connected to judgment of particular groups who have wielded power abusively and stand under God's judgment. And such is the case for Israel's leaders in chapter 34 and their neighbors to the southeast, the Edomites, in chapter 35. Uh, Ezekiel here takes up the classic metaphor uh, of the people of Israel as sheep, with shepherds representing Israelite kings, as well as other leaders. In Ezekiel, it seems that the shepherds refer to Israelite kings, but also more broadly, to other members of the ruling elite, those who wield political, religious, and economic power. Uh, the indictment here laid out in the first eight chapters of 30, first eight verses of 34, is not simply that the powerful have been tending to their own needs instead of the needs of the people, but that they have been using the sheep for their own unjust gain. The failure here is not one of neglect, but of abuse. You, uh, 34.3 says you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. This particular accusation has appeared repeatedly in the book that the political, economic, and religious establishment use their power for their own gain at the expense of those whose interests uh, to, of those whose interests these elites are supposed to serve. Uh, the accusation acquires, is, becomes even more specific here. Israelite leaders have not healed the sick. They have bound up, they have not bound up the injured. They have not gone in search of the lost sheep. The metaphor of the shepherd is powerful because of the range of duties required of, an, of a good shepherd not simply to herd and feed the sheep, but to tend them all, the vulnerable and the lost, as well as the strong with care and compassion. Instead of tenderness, those in power in Israel have ruled with force and harshness. The result is that the sheep, God's people, have become prey to wild animals and are scattered uh, over all the earth without protection without the protection they should expect from a shepherd. This indictment suggests that due to not only incompetent, but also uh, bad leadership, evil leadership, the people have been subject to economic and political injustice and violence, as well as the incursions of foreign powers. The responsibility for the scattering of the people over the earth, that is the exile, is also here clearly laid at the feet of Israel's leadership, um, as opposed to the widespread belief among Ezekiel's audience that Yahweh's defeat uh, at the hands of foreign gods explains the exile. So they're blaming it all on Yahweh instead of themselves. The judgment on these actions uh, begins in verse 10, and the imagery here is pretty shocking. Quote, I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. Uh, the reader here is startled to imagine the shepherds as guilty, not of neglect, but of the outright villainy of exploiting their power and authority for their own pleasure. They do not feed the sheep, they eat the sheep. The situation is even more dire uh, than the one that we see depicted in Matthew's gospel in chapter nine, where the sheep suffer with no shepherd at all. There they are harassed and helpless. Better to have no shepherd than the ones Ezekiel describes. More startling, more startling still is what comes next. 
In 3411, I will myself search for my sheep and will seek them out. Through the shepherd metaphor, God is revealed as one who searches for a people who are scattered and lost, brings them home again, nourishes them with good food and a healthy environment, and heals them by binding up their wounds and strengthening the weak and vulnerable. In verse 16, uh, the metaphor shifts where the elite had been cast as the malevolent shepherds. Now with God as the shepherd, the powerful become the strong, fat sheep who will not escape punishment because they made life um, miserable for the leaner, weaker sheep. The governance of this divine shepherd who was both compassionate to the vulnerable and committed to justice for the oppressors provides a stark contrast to life under Israel's earthly leaders. The image of God as the one to shepherd God's people with compassion and love is, of course, present elsewhere in scripture. Uh, we get Psalm 23, certainly, and John chapter 10, where Jesus is depicted as the good shepherd. The relationship of these very uh, various Old Testament texts to each other uh, is not clear. Uh, but the imagery here in Ezekiel 34 was very likely a resource for John 10. In fact, Jesus, when he refers to himself as the good shepherd, likely has this passage of scripture in mind. Um, so starting in 35, uh, we have judgment on Edom. Um, the transition from the promises of, to Israel of a compassionate shepherd with its renewal uh, of covenant relationship with God to the judgment on Mount Seir in Edom uh, seems abrupt, seems to shift quickly. And so we rightly ask, what does one have to do with the other? The judgment against Edom is puzzling um, because there's already been an oracle against Edom in chapter 25 uh, with all those other oracles against the foreign nations. The oracle in 35 is sandwiched between the promises to Israel in chapter 34 and the promises to Israel in 36, which seems like some kind of a strange arrangement. It seems as if it's an interruption here. Um, well, a couple of thoughts here. First, Edom is one of Israel's neighbors who apparently took most, uh, the most advantage of Israel's dire situation at the time of the first Babylonian uh, incursion. They actively participated in their destruction. They are accused of nurturing an ancient grudge, verbal abuse, and acting from hatred and envy, all of which evokes the brotherly rift between Jacob and Esau, right? Genesis chapters 25 uh, and on through chapter 33. Um, uh, and remember, Edom is the father uh, uh, of Edom. It's the, he is the father of the tribe of the people of Edom. Edom's actions toward Israel and toward God um, are all the more egregious uh, for being, in a sense, within the family. So that while the Edomites and the Israelites are not the same people, they are still distantly related. And that makes, that makes Edom's crimes against Israel even worse when it comes from people who are connected uh, in a familial way. So Edom's attitude and behavior toward Israel are particularly heinous, but still one may wonder why this oracle against Edom appears here. The key lies in the connections between this oracle against Mount Seir in Edom and the promises to the mountains of Israel in chapter 36. Judgment against Edom's mountains and promises to Israel's mountains are an implicit connection, but that connection becomes explicit in 36.5, quote, I am speaking in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who with wholehearted joy and utter contempt took my land as their possession because of its pasture to plunder it. The language of punishment against Edom, um, I will make you a perpetual desol desolation and your city shall never be inhabited, is repeated as a promise to Israel. It is precisely Israel, uh, desolate wastes, 
and Israel's desolate wastes and desert towns, which have become a source of plunder uh, in an object of derision to the rest of the nations all around that will once again become lush and populated. Edom will suffer the same fate that they inflicted on Israel, even as Israel's land will become abundant once again. One final detail here, Edom is accused of claiming Judah and Israel for itself, even though the Lord was there. Uh, three words, Yahweh was there, the Lord was there, appear almost as an afterthought here, yet they subtly express one of Ezekiel's main claims, that, that though the Lord is not constrained by Israel to be in the temple in Jerusalem, neither is God absent from Israel even at its most desperate moment. God can be in Babylon with the exiles, as well as in Israel, when all appears to be death and destruction. And the claim that God was present at one of Israel's darkest moments anticipates the claim of eternal divine presence with which the book concludes. Chapter 48, verse 35. So in chapter 36, we get the recreation of the land. So to understand the promises to the mountains of Israel, one must return to the judgment against the mountains in chapter six. There the Lord announced that the mountains would be stripped bare and laid waste, that they would undergo a kind of erasure. Um, the totality of that destruction recalled that the prime, uh, primeval flood, uh, the, recalls the primeval flood in Noah's day, uh, nothing was left. Now the promise is to renew the land. In fact, it to recreate it all over again. The language of creation saturates these chapters here, and it only makes sense when one recognizes that for Ezekiel, human identity, uh, along with the land itself, have been wiped away, something that would have been very difficult to understand uh, in Ezekiel's day. The intensity and the extent uh, of the eradication is not simply a function of the is not simply a function of the intensity of, of God's divine wrath. Rather, from Ezekiel's point of view, nothing of the old is usable. God must start from scratch. A new earth and a new humanity are possible, but only by the unilateral action of God that begins the work of creation all over again. In chapters 36 and 37, God acts not simply to renew Israel and the land, but to recreate them entirely. Chapter 36 has the recreation of both people and land in view, whereas when we get to 37, um, uh, 1 through 14, um, we will have a focus on the rebirth of the people alone, but both of these are deeply connected. Uh, of particular interest is the creation imagery here, um, especially in 36, 8 through 11. Um, the vocabulary is not identical, but the imagery is very similar to the creation accounts that we read about in Genesis 1 through 3. You have such language here as the mountains of Israel shall, shall shoot out your branches and yield your fruit. Um, I will turn to you and you shall be tilled uh, and sown and I will multiply human beings. Uh, you also have, I will multi multiply human beings and animals upon you. They shall increase and be fruitful. All of this language reminds us of the first creation. Here Ezekiel uses this similar language to talk about new creation. Um, the promise uh, that we read about in verse 11 here uh, in, in 36 is striking. I will cause you, that is the mountains, to be inhabited as in your former times and will do more good to you than ever before. So here we have the language of the goodness of creation. Uh, it's echoed, but there is a twist here. This new creation will be better than the first one, uh, which as Genesis 1 uh, makes the claim was not only good, but very good. Uh, for Ezekiel, the new creation must be better than very good. 
and uh, getting rid of the dismal history of idolatry and violations of the covenant. These things for the new creation to be better than very good, these things cannot be repeated. With the mountains restored, uh, the second part of chapter 36 turns to God's creation of a new humanity. Not surprisingly, we get uh, priestly language here of purification, uh, but the metaphor shifts to um, verse 26, a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body, the heart of storm, stone, stone, and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, the result of this divine imagery is that the people will be able to obey, to obey the law, the Torah. My spirit I will set within you, says God, and I will make it so that in my statutes you walk and my ordinances you keep and do. Uh, you know, and so although the original creation was good, it was not good enough in Ezekiel's view. Now, the unilateral action of God to recreate human beings results in their new capacity to live as God's people. And it was precisely that capacity that was lacking in the original human nature. The rest of the chapter returns to the image of the land as newly fruitful and abundance of grain, fruit, and other produce removes the threat of famine. And the land will once again be tilled as it was in the original Garden of Eden. Uh, verse 35, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined towns are now inhabited and fortified. This new land is an Eden for this new people. And that is where we end for today. Let us pray, gracious God, for another gift of another day we are thankful. And in Jesus, we know now that you are indeed renewing creation in your people, the church. We fall short of that new creation, but you continue to journey with us and work with us and move and give us your spirit so that we are uh, at least at the very least heading toward uh, that day when all things will be new. Thank you for the gifts that you have given to us and for the gifts that are appearing to us uh, in new ways each and every day in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, have a good day, be blessed.